good stuff. So guys, uh, again, thank you very much for joining that call. Uh, I would be pretty much excited to discuss a topic that I'm passionate about, right? Uh, don't expect it to be like a scientific talk. I'm probably, I probably don't have the capacity to, to, to do that. Uh, but still, like, I, I, I think it's a nice provocation, like, uh, I would be happy if, if it would be like a food for some thought on your side at the end of the day. So with that said, we are going to try to come up with a sentence which would kind of describe what it takes to be a leader those days, right? Um, and before we delve into that, just a few words about me. Uh, so I've been uh, dealing with software engineering and probably I've tried all positions that you can imagine in a tech department up till now, like maybe 16 years ago. Uh, right now, I'm a senior software development uh, manager at Secret Escapes, or I'm the one because we don't have other uh, colleagues with that title. Uh, what I can tell you about me, uh, like, I, I feel that I'm a passionate traveler, right, full of enthusiasm. So whatever I try to pick up with, I, I, I'm really passionate about that and I really enjoy uh, the journey, like, the outcome, you never know. There are things that you cannot plan in life, as we all got to know recently. But still, if the journey is the one that's a word, that's, that's a great motivator to me. <coughs> and with that said, let's jump on the topic. So in order to understand why, why I feel passionate about that, I'd like to look very carefully at that slide. Uh, to be honest, there are probably more flags that should be here, but I, I, I just don't have the memory for that. But the thing is that, like, I'm a Bulgarian guy uh, who moved together with his family living in Germany. But even in Bulgaria, I have worked for a Bulgarian, German, uh, and Israeli companies. And when I moved to Berlin, I started working for a US company, then I moved to a UK company. And on the way, I got to meet people from all those countries that you see on your screens, actually. And that was um, like a life um, changing experience to me because um, I, I had to, to deal with leadership, both formal and informal, for quite some time. And then you know, when, when you're like fishing the pond, you know, that's great. You know how to approach challenges, how to resolve them on that front. But the thing that kind of yeah, may may catch you, yeah. Sorry. The thing that, that may catch you a little bit off guard is when, when you don't know. And debatedly, the biggest unknown for me turned out to be uh, the culture and not only the, the culture of my colleagues and my friends, uh, but also the, the corporate culture, uh, the way things work actually in companies in different regions and stuff. And I also realized that there, like, at least sometimes, uh, companies could, could benefit more um, and get to better uh, em employee engagement, let's say, if they just pay attention uh, to the cultural differences uh, of their subsidiaries. But with that said, like, I, I just had a challenge in front of me, right? I had to uh, lead people in different contexts, in, like where, where uh, problems, one and the same problems were solved, like basically in very different ways, right? So I should have been creative. And that's, that's when I started thinking about leadership as a whole and why, why it's so tricky, so to say. And in order to, to, to illustrate what I find a bit tricky about leadership, to the least of it, I'd like to present you actually uh, with like an extract uh, of the brief history on the scientific efforts to actually unveil the secrets of leadership. And it all started like at around 1840, 
uh, when the first theory, scientific, scientifically backed up theory like emerged. And that was the one called great man theory, where we basically had a hero, like the leader was a hero and the hero was just born like that, you know, um, it's like just by chance or maybe by heritage, but leaders turned out to be born like that. Uh, of course, that naive perception was changed uh, over the next decades. Uh, and people figured out many, many things about leadership, right? Uh, the second big step were two theories or set of theories uh, where scientists started looking at leaders and they, they started, tried to, to define like what's the subset of traits that, that emerge within a leader and make that person a leader, right? Uh, that was a fail, like, maybe not an epic fail, there were many learnings, but then because of that, they, they kind of concluded that it's not very easy to formalize that list. Uh, that's why they, they kind of jumped on the next thing, which is probably very logical, like what would be, like how, how leaders actually express their leadership, like what are, what are the behaviors expre behavioral expressions. Uh, well, that was also a step further, but not exactly, not exactly what we currently understand as leadership. And then we had a contingency, a set of contingency theories that kind of stopped evolving maybe at around 1990. Uh, but uh, the, the, like one, they, what it's all about, like they started adding context uh, to leadership, like, okay, and, and exploring how we can actually breed or mass product leaders, right? But one very important uh, finding turned out to be that, uh, like, you cannot just pick a random leader and throw, and throw her in, into a random challenge, right? Uh, and also, it turned out that company, companies actually matter. And of course, the scientists, they, they explored the problem in terms of company sizes, in terms of geographies, in terms of whatnot. Uh, but it turned out that maybe, maybe if you throw someone like Bill Gates into a call center, that, that wouldn't be so great. I mean, he would probably do well there, but maybe there are other challenges better suited to that kind kind of leaders, right? And Bill Gates was just a random example. Pick anyone who, who know, um, and, and it would be equally valid. And then we started, like we proceeded discovering things around the context of leadership. So it turned out that there was a second, like it's, it's not only leaders, right? Uh, it turned out that there is a second group maybe equally important and if not more important, the so-called followers. And that's when uh, actually we started talking about relationships between leaders and followers and, and it turned out that things like trust and respect uh, are actually very key for high quality relationships that result into a very good outcome on the professional side of things, right? And then we had the ideas of transformational leadership, uh, which basically, again, emphasize, puts even more focus on that relationship and staying healthy through the years. And eventually, uh, pretty recent theory, the system leadership theory, uh, is all about uh, us all acting as, I would say, as a distributed system uh, for those of you who have technical background, uh, like we have, it, it sees all of us that we have a collaborative responsibility to act uh, like for the whole. Uh, and that's how we sacrifice ego. That's how we go for collective decisions. That's how uh, we actually find a very diverse point of view, much more beneficial than having just a couple of experts sitting there and making uh, decisions based on their experience and expertise only. So that's, that's 
how it happened. And I, I put that slide here just to uh, sum it up, uh, like what I kind of described right now. I won't go through all those topics again. I don't think that we need to uh, repeat them. But the thing that I personally found uh, like a revelation at some point, and now call me stupid, maybe it's supernatural, but I just didn't see that. Like, uh, it's actually not that leadership is getting more complicated than it, than it is, right? It's just that we didn't know a heck about what leadership is all about. And when we started working on that topic relatively late in the human history, let's say, compared to other sciences or branches, branches of science, like I believe then that then we started to, to kind of understand what it's all about, but we haven't understood it all yet, right? Uh, because right now uh, there, are, there are interesting studies in the field of neuroscience, for example, where uh, scientists are trying to like understand what's going on in the brain of leaders, right? Then there is also genetics. So people in that field are trying to figure it out. Is there, if there is anything like related to our heritage and previous, like anything encoded in our DNA that could make us better or not so good leaders. Uh, and eventually, eventually we have um, studies in all kinds of areas related to the importance of uh, different cultures, let's say, ethics of leaders, like if, like what, what does, like how levels of ethics or different ethic norms impact decisions of, uh, of leaders, if that restrains them, if that makes them even more powerful, how morale has an influence, how, like, how diversity has an influence on leadership. So actually, I think that the, 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 the study is ongoing and the research process is ongoing and it's only getting, it's only going to, to, to get to more interesting and also probably more complex uh, secrets that would be revealed in the future. But now, because it's like science is cool, uh, but sometimes a human perspective may, may also be interesting. Like if you ask me, and that's not scientifically proven at all, that's my hypothesis basically, but I see that we have a new reality in tech specifically. Well, maybe not so new in tech, but, but new reality that has like its own unique challenges and maybe it has a lot of potential for great opportunities. And that's where I think uh, that leadership will evolve because think about it, like I keep hearing from my friends all the time that uh, they get approached by companies, uh, not necessarily in Europe, that they get offered uh, freelance contracts for fully remote work. I keep reading about companies actually that are uh, moving to fully remote uh, models, like Slack, for example, is, I guess, a good one. Uh, and, and that means like few things, right? So it means remote work legalized basically for many, many people, but that would also mean a huge organizational decentralization. And in order for companies, teams to sustain that, uh, it also means quite some agility on, on the organizational side of things. But like, I, I think that one, one of the biggest challenges in reality would be related to the culture shock or this collision of uh, too many cultural aspects that are like brought in by individual contributors working remotely uh, as opposed to the culture that's been promoted in the headquarter, for example, or maybe the one that's been established already in the company. And that's where I think uh, 
leaders can help us to, to like try to fill that void because it's a void, it's not a gap, believe me. Uh, imagine, just imagine like a team of eight people working from all over the world in different time zones and we need to, to work with that and now scale that example to a whole organization and then to a company of let's say 300 people or 30,000 people. Well, that's huge, right? And that's where I think leaders uh, should try to help to, to get to make that happen because it's, it's happening anyway. Right, and so we started with the ambition to write a sentence. Now, like I cheated, I, I was quite clear that I wouldn't be able to write that sentence at all. Uh, at least not, not for, for all types of leaders that you can imagine in all types of contexts they could be working, living and so on and so forth. Uh, but like what I think is that you can try formulating that thing on your own for your own context, your own reality or perception of reality, right? And that may help you in two ways, like either you get even better leaders than you are right now, or it would help you with making other important decisions in life that you may be overlooking right now. And that's, I, I, I believe, very important. Like that's, that's where it all starts. And a final word about leadership. I think that it's a, a kind of an utopia that leadership is a reserved territory or a prerogative for management personnel only. I think that everyone should be both leader and a follower in slightly different ways, right? Like I could be on my end, for example, I am a team member, I'm a tech lead, I'm a senior engineering manager, and that's in different contexts. And wherever, whatever I do, right? Like in my team, when I'm a team member, I'm following and I'm obeying the rules. And that's it. When I'm a tech lead and I need to make technical decisions, for example, I decide how to do that, whether I should involve the team or not. Like you can imagine what probably what I choose to do and stuff like that. But when I'm a senior engineering manager, for example, and I work on departmental topics, I need to follow like most of them. And that's because, that's because I have no way to force people to do things, right? But I respect their expertise and their experience and I trust them. And I know that if I don't follow them, in a way, like if I don't set a direction and then follow them, and if I just lead them, they will have no incentive to actually have, a, like, they, they won't have motivation to lead, actually. And I should be end up leading everything, and that's totally impossible. So with that said, I have no sentence, but I have a poem for you. And I didn't write that one. <laughs> it's, it's a Japanese poem actually um, and every kid in Japan like every every student knows about that uh, because it's all about it's a poem about three very important people to the history of Japan these are the people who started fought some of them died but eventually managed to unite Japan being a territory a widely like in a war zone basically uh, in the 17th century. So those three people are different types of leaders and I, I guess that each and one of them kind of had to be exactly the leader that is described here because of the challenges that he had uh, on the plate. But it says the following, what would you do if the bird does not sing, that's the question, right? Now see how the three leaders would approach that. So the one who actually started the whole initiative with reuniting Japan, the one who had to be the startup mind, the entrepreneur, um, 
and the one who basically started from zero only with his huge wealth, so to say, like he, he, he would just say kill it if it does not sink, right? That's the approach, like do whatever you need, even kill the bird, but make it sink. Now see what the second guy with, who is known as uh, Hideyoshi says, like that's the, the one who actually managed to bring things almost to their end. Like his approach was totally different. He, he had very, very modern way of leading his troops. He emerged from a very poor background, by the way. Like he was born, uh, he was born uh, in a village. He didn't have any noble uh, past. And that's, that was a huge showstopper back then, right? So that guy has a slightly different philosophy. So he will make that bird sings. And then the one at the end is actually known as the first shogun of uh, Japan. He lived, outlived both Nobunaga and Hideyoshi, but uh, he is known for his patience. And that's how he actually managed to, to build up uh, a whole system and uh, like out of, out of nothing when eventually the kingdom was there. So that's, that's something to, to think about, right? And because I, I kind of talked about studies and then I talked about the Japanese poem. So here are maybe a short list of nice books that are totally not scientific. They're very fun to read. Uh, I just found them by, just, just by chance. So I guess we will share the presentation after the talk. If you have some time and you, you'd like to learn about leadership in a nice and enjoyable way, feel free. I, I've attached some links so you can find uh, the books later. And yeah, with that said, thank you very much. And I hope that it was an interesting talk to you. Now, I guess it's time for questions. Yeah, thanks Emil. Thanks Thank a lot. You. That was that was really cool. Any questions? Do we just shout out questions, or should we type them into the chat box? Yeah, I mean you can shout them out if you want. Okay, so Emil, thanks so much for your time. My question to you: in in doing all your research on what it what it takes to be a, a successful leader, in a sentence, what did you learn? What was the most profound thing you learned, just out of curiosity? Well, the most profound thing that I learned is that, you know, you don't need to, to, to go through all those studies to actually meet great leaders out there. Like, I guess that the people that I've shadowed and that I learned from eventually didn't, didn't read all those studies. Like they were self-educating themselves but no, so the good news is that everyone can be a great leader if just a true human being, if you ask me. That's, that's the most profound thing I found. Oh, and also I found, I found another very interesting thing. Like I, I, I thought about leadership and where we see signs of leadership and stuff. And I can provoke you with another question guys, like, where do you think, where do you see like the strongest leadership where things are really tough? I, I have a theory, I can share it with you if you want. Okay, so no one yeah, is saying share anything. Share it please, share it please. <laughs> okay, like uh, I, I have two boys guys, uh, three and five years old and uh, my my elder son just uh, is now going to to the school actually for the first year, and they handed over to us a huge huge pile of things that I collected while the kid was there in the kindergarten, and like I, I first of all I didn't know half of the things that they were doing there. Second of all, I think that I I, I know how it is with two children. Like, can you imagine what it is to manage? 30 children, for example, at once. And that's, that's where I, I think we can find uh, great examples of leadership because if you're able 
to bring that kind of, uh, let's say, discipline within kids who are basically uncontrollable, right? Then, then you need, you need, you know a little bit about psychology and how to do things. And, and when they talk to me as a parent, I, I should tell you that I always feel quite respectful about that experience. Like, and that's why I think that if we are about to talk about leadership, we should be looking around and that's, that's very much enough, very often. Any other questions? Oh, thank you. Cool. Doesn't seem like there is, but yeah, um, brilliant. Thanks a lot, Emil. Um, what I was going to say just before we started is that um, I'm going to share our community page in the chat. Um, so anybody that's interested in Agile London that we, we do in, in the UK, feel free to join those. Um, and there's also some, some info on there about our fundraising that we've been doing during this pandemic. So any of you that want to donate, feel free, but it's not compulsory. But again, Emil, awesome. It was a great talk and uh, everyone have a nice evening. Thank you guys. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you, Thank you very much. Ciao. Nice evening. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.